Ancient Faith Radio presents Speaking the Truth in Love with Father Thomas Hopko. Father Thomas is the Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary and the author of numerous books and articles. From his study in Elwood City, Pennsylvania, here is Father Tom. When contemplating the festival of Pentecost, the last and final day of the Paschal celebration, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we were led to contemplate the dogma of dogmas of Christianity, the Theologia par excellence, and that would be the contemplation of the tri-personal Godhead, the tri-hypostatic divinity, the one God and Father, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, the one Holy Spirit in perfect divine unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one in essence, one in divinity, same divinity, and undivided. And we appeal to all Christians to contemplate the communion between God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the relationship between these three hypostases, understanding as well as we can penetrating into the mystery of the Godhead itself as it's revealed to us in the incarnate, crucified, resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ who sends the Holy Spirit upon us, who proceeds from the Father. The Holy Spirit, who was the Spirit of God from the very beginning, creating the world, speaking through the prophets, acting in creation. The same Holy Spirit that Job in the Bible said that if God would withdraw his breath, the breath of the Almighty, everything would just collapse into nothingness out of which it was made. So we contemplate the whole of the divine activity from the beginning of creation into the ages of ages as the activity of the one God and Father, the one Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Logos, and the Holy Spirit. And we mentioned that in the Russian tradition, on Pentecost itself, very often the icon of St. Andrew Rublev of the three angels that appeared to Abraham, now considered to be an icon of the symbolical icon of the Holy Trinity, is often presented in the Church for Contemplation. And this leads to the issue of the iconic graphic depiction of the Trinity. It's a problematic issue, uh, highly controverted. People discuss it, it's disputed. But I would share with you how I have come to understand it. First of all, the icon is rooted in the doctrine of the Incarnation. And the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Word of God, becomes flesh and is incarnate as the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of Israel. Now, in contemplating Jesus and in defending the confession of faith in the holy icons, it could be said in the strictest possible way, with strict akrivia, as we say in Greek, strict, accurate teaching, that there can be no icon of the Holy Trinity. There cannot be an icon of God the Father who is not incarnate, whom no one has seen, who is invisible forever, and certainly no icon also of the Spirit of God, the breath, the wind, the fire of God, because the Spirit is not incarnate. God the Father is not incarnate. Only the Son is incarnate, and the Son is the icon of the invisible God. So Jesus would say, he who sees me sees the Father, but the only way to see the Father is to see the face of Christ. Nevertheless, (laughs) there has grown up in Christian tradition two depictions two artistic presentations that are meant to inspire and encourage the contemplation of the uncreated trinity, one of whom for us men and for our salvation has become human of the Virgin Mary. And I say two, not just one, but two. One is an iconographic depiction, a fresco depiction, which is usually not venerated at all. It's put on the wall simply for the contemplation and edification and inspiration of the faithful. And that would be a depiction of the Ancient of Days from the book of Daniel 7, where this Ancient of Days is depicted verbally. In other words, if you read Daniel 7, it describes how this vision is seen. And in Isaiah, of course, also the vision of Isaiah in the temple of the Lord God sitting upon the throne you have a kind of a verbal description. Now here, of course, this description is to be taken symbolically because God is invisible, but God kind of revealed in the revelation 
this kind of vision to understand him. Now, if we stick with the Ancient of Days in Daniel, it describes this figure, and that very same figure is presented in the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelation, depicted in exactly the same way of how he looks with all of these apocalyptic languages of white as snow and and lighter than light and like burnished brass and gold and shining and linen. And you have all of these human created elements put into that depiction. Well, without getting into it in any detail, we know that in the prophecy of Daniel, you also have presented to the ancient of days one who is like a son of man, who looks like a son of man, a human image, who is given all honor, dominion, glory, majesty, power, together with him who sits upon the throne. And in the apocalypse, that's the way it would be put. And that son of man is the son of God, the one who was killed and is made alive again, called usually in the apocalypse, the lamb of God who was slain from before the foundation of the world. But that lamb clearly is the son of man, the main title of Jesus in the New Testament, who is Jesus Christ, and therefore really human. So what happened was that in fresco painting in churches, especially churches where liturgy was celebrated like in the apocalypse, in order to assist the people in their celebration, you had these frescoes of painting of God the Father, or the God of hosts, the Lord God Sabaoth, who is the Father of Jesus, as described, as depicted in Daniel 7 and in the Apocalypse. And then you have either within him on his lap or within his bosom, or even at his right hand following the line, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and the enthronement of the incarnate, crucified, resurrected, and glorified Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, the Son of Man. You had this Ancient of Days, and he was depicted with a face that looks like the face that's always the face of Jesus. So either within him or on him or at his right hand, you have Jesus, clearly Jesus, always depicted as Jesus is iconographically depicted, easily recognizable, and even identified. Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. But then the face of the Jesus and the face of the Ancient of Days are similar. The face of the old figure is like the face of Jesus, And then you have them both put within a mandorla. And we spoke about mandorla before as an iconographic device, whereby you know that this is not incarnate. You know that this is a mystical spiritual vision. You know that this is to be interpreted spiritually. You know that it's to take us beyond itself. And that it is not a kind of historical, incarnational reality like the person of Jesus Christ himself or Mary or the apostles who are clearly historical and incarnate. It would be similar to the depiction of an angel because the angel also has no body. The angel is not incarnate. Nevertheless, there are descriptions and then there are iconographic depictions that help us to understand these mysteries. And then usually with this father and the son in the mandorla, with all these like rays of divinity, and very often the apocalyptic beasts are put there, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, and so on. They're put there in this mandorla, with sometimes with hosts of angels and faces of angels and wings around them to show that this is a mystical vision, somewhat similar to the vision you find in Ezekiel of the four beasts and the wheel in the wheels and this kind of Merkaba, this uh, chariot type of mysticism. Uh, But anyone who is learned and astute in Christian and biblical tradition know that this is a kind of symbolical mystical vision, especially since iconographically it's put within a mandorla, which no human eyes could see and is not historical. So what you have there is that depiction. And then very often there can be a fiery image of the spirit, but more often a dove, as from the epiphany at the baptism of Jesus, also in a mandorla also shown to be that it's not a bird as such. But this can function mystically, symbolically, as a bona fide, as an accurate, as an acceptable iconographic depiction of the Trinitarian Godhead, the tripersonal Godhead. As long as people know how to interpret it and know how to read iconographic language and connect it to the biblical images 
of Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and of course the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse. Now what happened, however, though historically, is that this iconographic language came to be lost. The church painting became to be very humanized, even westernized because of western painting. And then later on you had icons called icons of the Holy Trinity, which were simply an old man, a young man, and a bird with no mandorlas, very realistically painted and so on. And when that began to develop, then the church reacted and said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's got to look like the Ancient of Days and the Apocalypse. It's got to come from the Bible. It's got to be in a mandorla or else it's absolutely not acceptable. So the Stoblav Council in the Russian Orthodox Church, I think it was 1666, they even had a canon which said, which means in English, it is unacceptable, impious, not beautiful, not fitting to depict God the Father as a human being, as an old man. And that was rejected. Now, there are some pretty awful paintings in this way in very famous Russian Orthodox churches. In the newly reconstructed Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow, where they redid it exactly the way it was before the revolution. You have a very unacceptable, ugly painting of God as an old man in that cathedral. It's very, very sad that they actually put it in there, in my opinion, trying to speak the truth in love, as I understand the truth. It's very sad. But even in Valaamo Monastery, which was very Baroque, very Western in its art, even had a few statues around in the old days, you had a very terrifying picture of God the Father as an old man with a kind of a big white kind of woolly afro hairdo and then he's holding in his arms a little baby just a fat little baby with like a diaper on and the baby's holding a little sign that says Logos or Slova the word and then over it is a kind of a big bird with big claws and you can see that in Valam art books you could actually see it in Buffalo New York there's an exact copy of that painting in St. Peter and Paul Church on 44 Benziger Avenue in Buffalo, New York, the OCA church there, the Russian Orthodox Church there. But it has to be really said that this is not acceptable. And it's even condemned by a canon. It's, it's censured by a canon that you cannot have this. But my own personal opinion is, as long as you have the biblical depiction, in other words, as long as it's painted like it's described in the Bible, as long as it's in a mandorla, as long as the old man looks like Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, and Christ looks like him. So whether they're sitting Christ at the right hand, like in the Greek Orthodox Cathedral in New York City, the Greek Orthodox Cathedral of the Holy Trinity has such a depiction in its church. Mount Athos monasteries have these depictions on the ceilings and on the walls. I don't think that you can just point blank say that it's wrong, that it's unacceptable. It is mystical, it is symbolical, but I think properly understood, it's okay. It's even edifying as long as you connect it with the scripture and you know the iconographic language and it's not simply a realistic painting of an old man, a young man, and a bird. And I can actually say, forgive me for saying this on the radio, but I remember once in dialogue with a woman minister from the Universal Fellowship of Community Churches, which is a pro-gay church actually, a gay advocacy church, she actually said to me in a conversation one day, when are you guys going to stop believing in the two boys and the bird? And by that she meant Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And she called it the two boys and the bird. Now that's what happens when our icons are wrongly done and are not real icons at all. And that's what happens when people do not understand how this symbolical depiction coming from the scripture is to be understood. God the Father is not an old man. He's not human. He's not incarnate. He's not a man at all. Jesus Christ is a real man. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. The Holy Spirit is not a tongue of fire. The Holy Spirit is not some living water poured out, although that's even used. The Son of God is not a lamb, even though that's symbolically used sometime. But properly understood, knowing the scripture, having a scriptural mind, it's possible. But when it's done badly and is misunderstood and done wrongly, then you get blasphemous statements like thinking, that Christians believe in two boys and a bird. Now let's think about the icon of St. Andrew Rublev, however, because some people argue, we had theses at St. Vladimir Seminary written to argue, there's books published on this, that whereas the Ancient of Day image, the old man image, and the Jesus image is not acceptable in any form, even iconographically, even in Mandorla, but only 
the icon of St. Andrew Rublev is acceptable. I, honestly speaking, do not agree with that. And when I was a professor at St. Vladimir's and a dean, I wrote against those who would hold that the Rublev icon is okay, but the Ancient of Days icon is not okay. Because, in my opinion, the Rublev icon of the Trinity is as symbolic as the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, and some image for the Holy Spirit, like even a dove in a mandorla. It's just as symbolic. God is not three angels. The three angels who appeared to Abraham are still angels. They are called the Lord. They are spoken of in the singular very often in the Bible itself. But it's still, if you saw the three angelic figures, you could not simply say that is literally God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God. It is still an iconographic depiction that is based on something other than the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, as revealed in the New Testament, just like the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7. Now, if you take the St. Andrew Rublev icon of the Trinity, which is one of the greatest artistic masterpieces on the planet Earth, and one of the greatest theological confessions of Christianity on the planet Earth, there's a famous Russian Orthodox priest named Pavel Florensky, Paul Florensky, not George Florovsky, but Pavel Florensky, who wrote treatises and books about icons and beauty. He wrote metaphysical treatises contemplating the Godhead. He has a wonderful essay on the Holy Spirit. He was a scientist, a physicist, and he went to the Academy of Sciences under communism dressed in his priest's cassock and cross. Then he was imprisoned under communism and he perished in the prison camps of the Marxist atheists. He's a new martyr, the new martyr, Father Paul Ferensky. He said somewhere that the icon of the Holy Trinity painted by Rublev is proof that God exists. He said something so perfect, so magnificent, so incredibly crafted, so cleverly revealed, revealing the mystery of faith, nothing could surpass it. It's so divinely inspired that when you look at it, you know that God exists. That's what he claimed. I believe because of the icon of St. Andrew Rublev of the Trinity. However, we must know, and there are plenty of books about this. You have the Trubetskoy books about the Umozrenyev Kraskach, the contemplation in colors about icons, two volumes, St. Vladimir Seminary Press. You have Uspensky and Lasky, The Meaning of Icons, and a new book just published by St. Vladimir Seminary Press called The Rublev Trinity by a very old, venerable, Benedictine Roman Catholic monk named Gabriel Bunge. I think that's how you pronounce his last name, B-U-N-G-E. He wrote a very nice book about personal prayer, this the same old monk, white-haired, old, venerable man who lived as a hermit since 1988 or 1986 or whenever it was. At least about the last 30 years, he's been a, a Benedictine hermit in the West, very much inspired and erudite of the Church Fathers and of Russian Orthodoxy and Orthodoxy in general. Well, this book is called The Rublev Trinity, and Gabriel Bunge, it just was published just a year ago. It's available at St. Vladimir's Press. And he shows, as do Trubetskoy and as do Uspensky and Lasky and all the other art historians, every one of them, that the Rublev Trinity began as a fresco depicting the Philoxenia to Avramu, the hospitality of Abraham, and is taken from Genesis, where after the slaughter of the kings, as it says in Hebrews, and the Melchizedek appearing to Abraham in the Genesis story with his offering of bread and wine, and the Sodom and Gomorrah event, you have these three angelic figures, the three messengers of Yahweh, visiting Abraham, telling him that his wife Sarah is going to have a baby in her old age, and she does, and she names the baby Laughter, because she laughed when she had that baby Isaac, and that the promise to Abraham would be fulfilled, and in his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. But you have where Abraham is host to these three angels, these three men, as they're called, or angels, messengers, they bring him to the house. He has Sarah prepare a meal for them with the lamb, and they eat together. And it's depicted with other angelic figures around these three kind of human-looking angelic figures. And as is shown in the art history books, that theme was a very, very popular one in Christianity because Abraham life generally is a prefiguration in very detailed form of the gospel. You have Abraham being made righteous through faith. You have him believing in the one God who called him. 
You have the promise that in his seed, the one seed, as St. Paul said, which is Jesus, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. You have him offering Isaac, this very child that these angels predicted would be born, in sacrifice, and God doesn't allow him to sacrifice the child and puts the ram in its place, which prefigures the sacrifice of Jesus. Because when God offers his son, no angel comes, he dies. He dies. And he is even considered to be that ram in that story, prefigures Jesus. And then you have uh, Melchizedek, the priesthood that's not Levitical, who sacrifices bread and wine. And then these three angels prefiguring the Holy Trinity. It's kind of all in typos, in the types, in prefigurations, in shadows, in the Abraham story. And already in catacombs in Rome and in early 4th century, 5th century mosaics in various churches in the West and in the East, you have this depiction of the three who came to Abraham and no Christian could read that, especially in the light of the whole Abrahamic story and the Abrahamic covenant, without reading it Christologically through the lens of Christ and then coming to the conclusion that these three figures can prefigure the Holy Trinity. And so to make the long story short, that is what St. Andrew Rublev did. He took this particular iconographic tradition of the hospitality of Abraham and he crafted it into a symbolical, theological, mystical, iconographic depiction of the tripersonal Godhead, of the three persons of the divine trinity. Now, who was this St. Andrew Rublev? He was a disciple of St. Sergius. He was probably about 22 years old when St. Sergius died. St. Sergius died in the end of the 14th century, and André became a very preeminent iconographer in the beginning of the 15th century, in the 1420s is when he painted. And he was a monk of the Trinity Lavra. And we have to, that's very important, because St. Sergius of Radenesh, the greatest perhaps of all the Russian saints, and certainly the founder of modern Russia, and certainly his monastery and his relics at the Trinity Lavra north of Moscow is probably, can be said without any doubt, it's the spiritual center of Russian Orthodoxy and always was, even under communism. Father Meindorf used to speak of the two tombs, Lenin, which is dull, dreary, dead, and ridiculous, and then the relics of St. Sergius, which were in the lava that continued to be open under communism, where all the poor, the blind, the lame, everybody would show up and sing and pray. And I knew a woman in Texas whose husband died of cancer, and she was filled with grief, so she decided to do some tourism, took a trip to Russia, walked into the Trinity Lavra, heard the continuous prayer around the relics of St. Sergius, and immediately converted to Orthodoxy on the spot. Not understanding Russian or Slavonic, but just the power of the divinity and the beauty and the glory and the truth that were present in that room, in that church. And the church is dedicated to the Holy Trinity because St. Sergius had a particular love for the Holy Trinity. It was even said that he leapt three times in his mother's womb when he was born and his mother, St. Mary, she's canonized too with her husband, St. Cyril, the parents of St. Sergius, they said he would be dedicated to the Trinity. And then when he became a monk, he was Bartholomew, he became Sergius, and built his monastery in the north, and 116 of his disciples are canonized saints. The main church there was the Church of the Holy Trinity. And so this Andrew Rublev, who was a monk of that monastery, and is known about primarily through the life of St. Nikon of Radenesh, the immediate successor of St. Sergius, whose life was written by the same man who wrote St. Sergius's life, Epiphany Premudri, Epiphanius the Wise, a, a Serb, I believe he was, but he was a hagiographer. He wrote the lives of these saints. We know that Andrei Rublev was a monk of that monastery, and he was commissioned to paint the icon of the temple, the temple icon, so he had to come up with a kind of iconographic depiction of the Trinity because the church was dedicated to the Holy Trinity. And so he painted this icon, which is so famous, and practically everyone who knows anything about Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodoxy can picture that icon in their mind. And if they can't, they should be able to, of these three angelic figures that symbolize iconographically, mystically, the Holy Trinity. I can't resist saying that I first saw that icon with my own eyes under communism. In 1981, I was in Moscow, and it was still high time of communism. 
And that icon was in a museum. They had taken it from the Lavra, from the monastery, and put it in a museum. And they were showing it to tourists who were going through the museum. And it's a rather large icon, because the icon screen's pretty large at the Lavra, at the monastery. It's a rather large icon of these three figures, three angelic figures, which I will speak more about in a minute. But I want to tell you how uh, at that time I was in there, and there was a guide, a tour guide, who was taking people through this Tetrakov gallery in Moscow, where this marvelous icon of St. Sergius was under glass, and it was kept just in the museum. So when this tour group got in front of the, this icon, I was there by myself, but there was a tour group, and the guide was speaking in English. And she was telling these people in English that this icon of the Trinity, this icon that St. Urubrov painted, was the greatest masterpiece of Russian art that ever was made. And then she said, of course, it was in the old days because the motif was religious, because it was a religious time. But she said to the people that this icon, the way it's crafted out in these three figures that form a perfect circle and uh, who are together and whose faces look the same to show that they are equal and identical. She went on and on, and, and, and I will go on and on in a minute or two about that icon, but she went on and on about it. And then she said, and so this icon shows the soul of the Russian people. The motif is religious, but it's not really religious. It shows the longing of the Russian people that was ultimately perfectly fulfilled in communism. In Marxist communism, where you have unity and equality and sharing and everybody's equal and they sit around the table and they're all together and the colors are put in such a way to show the harmony and the unity and so on. And so she says, this is an icon of the Russian soul, the Russian idea, the Russian mind. What, what, and the Russian mind and soul and idea is longing for what everyone on earth is longing for. They're longing for perfect communist society of equality and so on. And so she went on and on and about that. And when she finished, again, I couldn't resist. I was standing in the back there. And I said to her, I said, excuse me, miss. I said, but would you mind if I say a little bit about that icon? And she could tell right away that I was an American by my accent and my English. And she looked at me a little bit puzzled, a little bit scared. But I think she was so curious. And my guess actually is that she was probably a believer, a real believer, but she was doing her job under communism and, you know, making a living. And a lot of those people who worked in those museums with icons, they were secret believers. And they would even propagate the faith by publishing icon books. They say, we have to understand the Russian soul. We have to understand Russian culture. And then they would put out a book of icons and tell all about the Bible, the gospel, the faith, the fathers, the patristic teaching. And and get all the dogmas and doctrines out there into communist society through books on Russian culture showing icons. But in any case, this woman, she kind of, like I say, after a little bit being taken aback, and she said, yes, you may. She said, yes, you may. And then I spoke to that group for about 15 minutes, like I'm going to do to you right now. And I told them what I'm going to tell you right now. And what happened was when I finished... <laughs> This woman looked at me and she said, thank you very much. That was really very interesting. And then she said to the group, well, let's proceed now on through our tour through the museum. But I remember how she was really happy that I had done what I did. And that's why I thought she was a secret believer. But what did I do? I said to the people, I said, you know, our tour guide just said that this shows the Russian soul and you can... Think about that in whichever way you want. But you should know that this icon comes from the Bible. And it originally was the icon of the three angels who visited Abraham and Sarah in the story of Genesis in the Bible to tell Abraham that his wife would have a baby through whom the whole world would be blessed. And Christians believe that that's Jesus. And on the old versions of this icon, you would even have Abraham present on the icon and you would have Sarah and you would have her cooking the meal because they ate together like in Holy Communion. They had a communion meal together. And in Abraham, the meal was bread and wine through the priesthood of Melchizedek. And I, I got into that a little bit, not much, of course, given the occasion. But then I said to them, let's look at the icon because for believing Christians and believing Russian Orthodox Christians, 
This is a symbolic icon of the divinity itself, of what Christians call the Holy Trinity, the one God and Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And then I proceeded to tell them the following, and it would help if you yourself could get this icon and look at it. Because when you look at the icon, you see that there are three figures, and they're painted like angels, but they have human faces. And the human faces are identical. Each of the face is exactly the same. They look exactly the same. And so that's to show that there's a unity, a sameness, a kind of an identity among these three depicted personages. Then you know that angels means messengers. And you know that the messenger is the messenger of God. And in the Bible, sometimes the messenger of God and God are conflated. Like even in the story to Abraham, it says three men, and then it says the Lord in singular, and then they're certainly treated as divine and from God. So you have this building up in the Bible. But by the time you get to Christianity, you have these three who would be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, when you look at the icon as a, a Christian, as Andrei Rublev himself, this Christian monk painting it in the 15th century, it's very clear that the central image in the picture is the one who stands for Jesus. How do you know? It's because he has on the vesture that Jesus always has on the icons of the Incarnation. It's the royal vesture of the Byzantine period. It's the cloak with red on one side, blue on the other side, and the golden royal insignia over the shoulder, the right-hand shoulder of power. And of course, if you did not have the angelic face and just looked at the body, any Christian, any Eastern Orthodox Christian would identify that as Christ right away. That You'd say, well, that's the one that stands for Jesus. And it's in the center. Now, you also know that it stands for Jesus because he's blessing a chalice. <laughs> there's a chalice on the table. So there's a meal and a chalice on the table. No Christian could look at that without thinking of Holy Communion. And no Christian could look at that without knowing that Jesus is the great high priest who offers himself. And then he is blessing the chalice like a priest would bless it, saying, this is my body, this is my blood. It's interesting to note he's blessing it with two fingers because this was before the Nikonian reform. And at that time, the Orthodox, particularly the Russians, would cross themselves and bless with two fingers because they were blessing with Christ. The cross had to be the imagery of Christ, who is God and man. It was only later that using the three fingers together depicting the Trinity for the use of the sign of the cross entered into Russia after the Nikonian reform. And the old believers did not accept it, and they do not accept it to this day. So the ancient icons, like St. Sergius and his time, the blessings would be with two fingers. So you have the Jesus figure blessing that icon. Now each of these figures is holding a, a scepter. It's to show that they're divine, and that comes from the Psalter also. Thy God, O God, is given power, and to you is the royal scepter. So it's a sign that they're ruling personages. Also, behind Jesus is the oak of Mamre, the oak in the Genesis story. But whenever you see a tree as a Christian, you think of the tree of life. And when you think of the tree of life, you think of the cross, the tree of the cross. So behind the Jesus figure is the tree that symbolizes the tree of the cross on which he was crucified. Now, you also have to know that in traditional iconography, the head of the table is not the middle, but it's the side. For example, Leonardo da Vinci, Last Supper, Christ is in the middle of the table. But even on the icons of the mystical supper, the Lord Jesus is on the side. As you look at it, it would be our left side. If they were looking out, it would be Jesus' right side. So he is at the right hand. You see, he's in the middle of the figure. Now, all of the interpreters of this icon say that the middle figure stands for Jesus, and therefore the one to his right, the one who's at the table on the side, is the one that symbolizes God the Father, because Jesus is bowing toward him, and the third figure on the other side of Jesus is also bowing toward him. So that means that the middle figure and the one on our right, as we look at it, are bowing toward the one who's on the other side of the table, meaning that he's the head. And that's how it would be understood that that one stands for God the Father. So that the third figure stands for the Holy Spirit. So there are three angelic images standing for Christ, the Father, and the Spirit. God the Father and the Spirit. 
Now, these three figures are crafted out. They're painted in such a way that they form a perfect circle. If you take a compass and go around their shoulders, around to the side, you have a perfect circle. Now, in the classic iconographic rule, you have inverse proportion. In other words, it is not three-dimensional in depth as a naturalistic painting would be, but it's the opposite way. You're kind of drawn into it. You become part of it because the proportions are backwards. The front of the table is smaller than the back of the table, which, of course, a naturalistic proportion would be just the opposite. And, of course, that table symbolizes a Eucharistic altar, the trapeza, the table where we eat. Now, not only are these three figures forming a perfect circle so that they show that there's a perfect unity, a perfect harmony, a perfect oneness among them, but it's also that unity and harmony is expressed in the colors that are used. Because if you look at the middle figure and move, looking at it, to our left, to the figure of God the Father, toward whom the two figures are reclining, you have the red and the yellow, which, when brought together, makes orange. And that's why that figure is orangish. On the original icon, it's an orangish hue, because it has those two colors together. And then if you take the blue that is on the incarnate garments of the middle figure who stands for Christ, and mix it with the red. So red and blue are green. And so green is the color that's on the figure that stands for the Holy Spirit. And green, of course, is a color for Pentecost. Green is a color of life. It's a color of the Spirit, at least in Eastern tradition. And so the goldish orange is the majesty of God the Father. So you see how the colors blend so you not only have a perfect circle in these three figures, but you have the colors blending the red and the blue into the green, the red and the yellow into the orangish or the golden. And so that those colors, I don't know the proper artistic terms, but they are just brought together. Then you have the building in the background and the heavenly Jerusalem. You see the shine, shine, the glorification, the kingdom. That's what you would have in this particular icon. And then another little point, but very important point, is that if you take the top of the table and the bottom of it, and the way that the hands of those other two figures are shown on the icon, you see the God the Father figure kind of receiving the offering, the Holy Spirit also somehow blessing, because there's an epiclesis at the liturgy, the Holy Spirit comes down upon us and upon our gifts. He's the one that accomplishes the activity of Christ. So he has his hand the spirit figure has his hand in the kind of a blessing figure toward the chalice also. But if you take the way their knees come down and go down to their feet, that inner space is exactly shaped like a chalice. The whole thing is shaped like a chalice, like the blood of Christ. And the blood, of course, is the life. And you see that red blood in the little chalice that's on the table. Then the whole table with its base down to the floor with the footstools of the father and the spirit figures in their inverse proportion, sitting in their majesty with their scepters, you also have a chalice figure, which, of course, again stands for the incarnation and the shedding of the blood of the Son of God on the tree of the cross. Now, in Father Gabriel Bunji's book and in Uspensky, Lasky, Trubeskoy, you have pages and pages. I've seen books in Russian, two, three hundred pages long, just on this particular icon. And in fact, this most recent book by this Roman Catholic Benedictine hermit, who is so learned in patristics and in orthodoxy and is such a lover of orthodoxy, that book is about 120 pages long. And it goes in a very detailed manner, not only through the iconographic tradition up to André Dubrov and to the painting of this icon, but it also goes through all of the biblical imagery and the biblical symbolism that's found in the Genesis story, in the scripture, in the apocalypse, and in the activity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how that was lived out through the time of St. Sergius, one of the great hesychastic, spiritual, mystical fathers of the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So, for Orthodox Christians, you cannot depict the Trinity, strictly speaking, in iconographic form. But there are biblical narratives that lend themselves to the contemplation of the Trinity, 
whose depiction in iconographic form can be an image for us of the of the uncreated trinitarian godhead the tripersonal divinity the father the son and the holy spirit the ancient of days with the son of man enthroned in glory and then of course the three who appear to abraham in the icon of saint andrew rublev of the three figures that clearly reveal to us in this confession of faith in colors and lines and images and forms silently there are no words but all the words of the bible are brought together in a perfect expression of the ultimate dogma of christian faith the dogma of the holy trinity in this particular icon of saint andrew rublev and anyone who believes in christ anyone with a scriptural mind anyone who knows the bible tradition anyone who reads the scripture through the lens of the crucified and glorified christ anyone who's read the book of genesis anyone who's read the new testament writings anyone who knows the apocalypse will contemplate this icon and find in it forever deeper and more perfectly the depiction of the great mystery of mysteries that the one god and father is the one god with his only begotten son and his all holy spirit and then we would contemplate this reality forever and we can begin doing it even now and therefore we can understand how that priest martyr that wonderful man father florenzi could have written anyone who encounters the icon of andrei rublev of the trinity then that icon will forever exist for him or for her as a living proof a kind of existential artistic proof that truly god exists and that one god is the father almighty creator of heaven and earth and his only begotten son jesus christ incarnate for us and for our salvation of the virgin mary and the holy spirit the lord and the giver of life the holy trinity one in essence and undivided